Hey, good Wednesday evening to you all. We welcome you back to the Battles AV Studio here in the friendly confines of the Pinnacle Church of Christ. I'm John Phillips. This is the pigskin preacher, a.k.a. Chuck Monan. Isn't it funny how you're recognized more by a pigskin preacher well, than uh, Chuck Monan? Uh, it's better than being called, say, the pig-faced preacher. Well, this is true. Pig-headed preacher? Pig-headed oh, preacher. Mm -hmm. I've heard that one before, yeah. but yes. that's Somebody a, resembles that remark. As the man said, I don't care what they call me as long as they don't call me late for dinner. That is the key to it. So there's that. We are glad to have so many of you tuned in. Um, a growing number. We are just blown away by the analytics that we get. Um, kind of gives us the numbers of who all is watching. Yes, we can see you actually through your television set. But we know that there are quite a few people that are watching, and we appreciate that. We appreciate you contacting us with text messages or emails to let us know uh, how we're doing, but also to submit your questions, and possibly they'll be used in our questions and answers. More than possibly, probably. Probably. There's a good chance yes. of it. But uh, that's a good segue into tonight. What are we going to be talking about? Well, this has uh, been in the news recently, and uh, you may have seen this in the newspaper or whatever news feed you get these days. But the question was brought up, what does the Bible say about Ash Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Now, that's kind of a feature, certainly in Roman Catholicism. It's kind of spread through the denominational world, and, you know, to no one's surprise. Yeah. It's kind of uh, infiltrated into some congregations and churches of Christ. Of the Lord's church. So, yeah. so on the surface of that, we would have a very short class discussion tonight. What does the Bible say about Ash Wednesday? Nothing. No, not a single thing. <laughs> not a word. So uh, class dismissed. Go in peace. Uh, there's a little bit more to it probably well, than that. There but, uh, you know, as, as different folks are looking. That's it. And they're looking, you know, what, what should I believe? What should I do? What should I practice? It shouldn't be of any surprise that when people abandon the <clears throat> platform of biblical authority for what they do in matters of religion, then they're just kind of grab bagging and that, well, this sounds good and that looks interesting and that's good. And in and of itself, if somebody wanted, for, for instance, uh, Lent, which is an old English word meaning the spring season, yeah. we're talking about the 40 days between uh, Ash Wednesday and Easter. Right. So in, in that, if you're following the liturgical calendar, which in Churches of Christ we generally don't. And, and let's talk about how did we even get to and, liturgical and, and calendar, yes, but, but that's a different Yes, discussion. that will come up, but uh, it, it's frequent that uh, a, a lot of Christians will ask the question, well, what are you giving up for Lent? Well, first of all, Jesus says, let a man deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're mm -hmm. certainly in the business of giving things up. We should be giving up sin if we wanted to start with something. Yeah. We should give up selfishness, we should give up greed, we should give up racism, we should give up laziness. I mean, there's, a, there's no shortage of, of a list of things that we should give up. But it's always kind of amusing to this. I, there was a, a comedian that uh, sadly died of a, of a drug overdose years ago named Greg Giraldo, who among comedians, he had a law degree from Harvard. Oh my. The man was pretty smart, uh, but he had enough highbrow humor. He, he had enough of brilliance, I think, despite some of the demons that he faced, yeah. to cut through the nonsense of the day. And he'd grown up, you know, Catholic and he'd understood this. And he mm. said, It always kind of set me aside and people say, Well, I'm giving up uh, this for Lent, or I'm giving up that for Lent. He said, Let me get this straight. Jesus was nailed to a cross, and you're giving up chocolate. That, that's, yeah, there's an equivalent, isn't yeah. it? And, and that's about... That's the fallacy of it. And that's the kind of, of reality uh, check that we probably need with this. Yeah, there ought to be things we ought to give up, mm -hmm. okay? One of my favorite songs is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And there, Isaac Watts says, All the vain right. things... Charm the charm me most. me most, I sacrifice them to Jesus. his blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we ought to be in the business of giving things up and sacrificing. But at the same time, if I didn't watch TV for a month or I didn't, get, I didn't eat chocolate bars for a month. If you think that that has anything to do with heightened spirituality, you're probably on a fool's errand. So, so that's kind of the, the question underneath 
the question that the, the, the 24,000 pound gorilla in the room is what are we doing as a church following after these religious traditions of men? Jesus had something to say about um, that. He said, well, did the prophet Isaiah prophesy of you saying this people um, honoreth me with their mouth and draweth near with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they, they do worship, worship me, me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men the commandments the, or the traditions of or men or the traditions of men yeah. and so that's kind of where we're at as a society under the broad umbrella of christendom christianity uh, we see a lot of people chasing after these trends and so well that church seems to be an in thing they're doing this for lent they're putting little crosses on their foreheads and so all of a sudden now we're adopting things that really the bible does not teach. Folks, listen, in the Lord's church, it's not just a trite saying, but we really do have a mandate to speak where the Bible speaks and to be silent mm -hmm. where the Bible is silent, to do Bible things in Bible ways, to call Bible things by Bible names. And so this whole idea of Ash Wednesday, um, I suppose there is some validity to Palm Sunday. Um, we could talk about Easter and how that all mm -hmm. came about. But really, when we look at the Bible, we see some events. And we are commanded to, to worship on the first day of the week. We're commanded to do the five essential elements of worship. We're commanded to live uh, and be faithful as we live the Christian life. And aside from that, a lot of these traditions we need to be very careful about. So let's talk about Ash Wednesday, what it is and what it isn't. Well, let's think about this. Uh, Jason Jackson offers a rather interesting description. He says this, Ash Wednesday is a religious holiday celebrated by the Roman Catholic Church, various Orthodox churches, and some Protestants. Brother Jackson would probably be surprised to say, and an increasing number, Church at least a Christ. handful of churches of Christ. My goodness. The holiday marks the first day of Lent, a 40-day period ending with Easter, not counting Sundays. Lent supposedly represents Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. You get it. And we mentioned coming from an old English word that means spring season. In mm -hmm. addition to the Ash Wednesday service, observing Lent may involve giving up something for a few weeks or some fasting. Some practitioners take this seriously, others not so much. Giving up soda on Fridays mm -hmm. or some other uh, trivial sacrifice that they seem uh, fit to deprive themselves of. So when you're asked, does your church celebrate Ash Wednesday? Well, how could you respond? Well, there's a number of ways that you would respond. If you were at Pinnacle, you'd say, no, we don't. We recognize what it is, and as John says, when the priest takes his hand and wets his finger and dips it in some ashes and then makes the sign of the cross on your head, that's supposed to remind you that you're a sinner. Yeah. Here's a thought. <laughs> Quit listening to Joel Osteen and these uh -huh. practitioners of the prosperity gospel and come over to the Pinnacle Church of Christ. If yeah. you want to be reminded that you're a sinner, we will do that with great frequency. I will remind you that I'm a sinner, that John's a sinner, We're that the sinners. elders are sinner, that all of us are sinners. That's something that we don't get very far away from at all because that is a fundamental core biblical doctrine. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest we don't need some man-made tradition where somebody is taking and, and smearing uh, some ashes, ashes on your forehead to remind us of something that the Bible basically mentions on every page. That's it. And so we're substituting or giving a false sense of religiosity. That's your favorite word, Bill Maher. Um, when really the Bible doesn't say anything about that. And you have to be careful because that's a slippery slope. Uh, I guess we might as well go ahead and say that we're going to practice uh, Hanukkah, Rosh Hashanah, um, Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. Hey, there's one we should do. Coming Charles, out de, Charles Duquette gave me an African dashiki. There I could you go. wear my you dashiki ought to, you ought to wear and we could practice Kwanzaa or Ramadan. That has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches we are to be doing as Christians to celebrate uh, Christ. We gather every first day of the week and celebrate Christ. And so these are some things that have come into vogue. And the danger is when you begin to follow um, trends of, of the world, 
uh, you're going down that slippery slope that's going to lead you into some practices that may actually be, um, I'm going to say pagan, can I say that? No, you can. Uh, yeah, you I think can. so. And so it's, it's a very slippery slope that we need to be careful now, about. Now, for, for full disclosure, let me say something here, okay? I have a pretty good relationship with a lot of Catholics. Oh, listen. Okay, I, we got a... We have the first black graduate of Catholic High <laughs> not, in Little Rock. Not the first. The no. Jackie Robinson of Catholic High. Okay, uh, so John is familiar with this. Really? I have been uh, more times than I could count to the monastery. I pray with my Benedictine monk friends, go. recognizing that there are many planks of Catholic theology I vehemently disagree with. Right. But when I see somebody who has made sacrifices for the Lord and their life is one of work and prayer, I can learn from that. So I, I'm hardly, I guess I don't want to offend anybody, but if you go back in Churches of Christ in our history, we were about as anti-Catholic as any <laughs> institution could be. I'm not that way, okay? I judge the merits of a thing based on its proximity to the teachings of Scripture. That's the key right there. And I there. think some of the things that they do are very close to Scripture. I think some of the things that they do are very far from Scripture. Let me give you an example. Okay, fish on Friday. You know where that came from? That came from an idea that a bunch of people just created that uh, it would make us more pious, pious, holy. more religious if we would forego eating meat, meat on Friday, so therefore we would eat fish. Right. I would suggest that fish is a form of meat, so I think you're kind of quibbling over degrees uh, of protein. But having said that, you realize that stopped with the advent and the adoption of Vatican II. Mm -hmm. When Vatican II happened, all of a sudden mass quit being uh, said in Latin, mm -hmm. but it started being held in the vernacular, whatever language. Common with, people. The common people, mm -hmm. precisely. And you didn't have to eat fish on Friday anymore. I grew up in the Michigan public schools well, eating fish every Friday because they just did it. People liked it. I'm crazy about fish, so you know it was all good. Yeah. But here's the point. There's nothing wrong with eating fish on Friday. Here's where... Don't attach the religious significance right to there, it, brother. That's, right there, Brother Phillips. It. When you start suggesting <clears throat> that if you do this thing that I just invented on the spot, and if you do this, that's going to bring you closer to God, you have crossed the line from biblical doctrine into false teaching, okay? Let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, how did we get there? Well, I'm not picking on the Catholics again, have mm -hmm. a deep, deep respect. Absolutely. Went to parochial school growing up in Catholic high uh, during my high school years. So I appreciate the dedication and the faith. Um, I appreciate the, the error, though, in some of their theology. First of all, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, complete revelation that's of God. Right. And that's what we try to, to follow as closely as, as we can in this modern day. They believe that the Bible is incomplete. It is, it it needs is to be added still to over being, the centuries. being uh, through, right. the, through the Pope and his uh, dictates and decrees, he can go in and, and interpret scripture and add to or take away and say this isn't a sin and Precisely. that is. And that's a problem. Because what you're saying then is that the Pope or whoever the head honcho of that particular religion is going to be has more authority than the Word of God. And that's a dangerous, dangerous place. Let me to give be. a perfect example from history. When it was declared that whenever the Pope speaks on matters of faith mm -hmm. or morality, it's got, it's that speaking. he speaks ex cathedra. In other words, when he speaks from the chair, he is incapable of error. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, that would is. have that, that would have been a news flash to the Apostle Paul. Yeah. Because when he saw Peter being guilty of racism toward his Gentile brethren, he says in Galatians chapter two, when I saw Peter, I opposed him to, him his, to face. his face. Yes, Why? He did. Because he because was, in he the was wrong. wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. Wait a minute. I thought that the Pope and Catholics usually hold that Peter was the first Pope. Okay, here's the thing. That was made up. Of course the Pope can be wrong. Of course any human being can be wrong. But the Catholic Church is a little bit arrogant in the sense that they think that whatever they decree 
to be of God is of God. And, and listen, the things that the scripture teaches are of God. The things that we add to that, you know, may or may not bring us closer to God or they may take us further away from God. Right. And Ash Wednesday is one of those things. Okay, I, I, again, what did we say at the beginning? There's nothing wrong with giving things up. Sure. There's nothing wrong with making sacrifices. Christians ought to be in the practice of that anyway. Listen, Jesus taught many times that we are to fast and pray. Mm -hmm. Watch and pray fast. And so if you decide for a spiritual discipline that you want to give up something, I think there is some uh, benefit and, and, and um, noteworthiness in doing that. But when we begin to uh, teach that as a doctrine, that this is the time to, to fast and, and we're going to give you the symbol of that and we're going to do it because everybody else is doing it, that's a very dangerous thing to do, and so we need to be careful. There is a second part of that that mm -hmm. I think we do need to talk about. Um, while we do have to confront error and try to present truth, uh, maybe we should also take a step back and say, uh, when someone asks, well, does your church practice Ash Wednesday, or what are you giving up for Ash Wednesday? Tell them no, but then ask them, why do you ask? and maybe use that as an opportunity to open a discussion into why we don't celebrate Ash Wednesday and possibly why you should think about whether you want to or not. Listen, I, I do not have a shortage of ideas. I have ideas and opinions on pretty much everything. But Chuck's ideas and opinions are not tantamount to what the Bible teaches that's about it. a that's, thing. That's the big So difference. anytime someone comes over to Pinnacle and they see, well, I see you guys do some things differently in worship than what we're used to. I said, well, for instance, what? Well, you sing a cappella. You don't have uh, instrumental music. Why do you do that? And we walk them through why. Well, you baptize people. I had somebody just ask me that last week. Well, how do you baptize? I said, we baptize by immersion. immersion. They said, well, why do you do that? I said, because the word means to dip, to plunge, Baptizo. to immerse. Yeah. That's what it means. I said, and all the examples of the New Testament are by immersion. Yeah. I said, okay. Uh, well, what about the Lord's Supper? I see you had that every week. Well, on the first day of the week, we, we came together to break bread. Acts why? 20 and verse 7. This is the thing. Everything that we try to do in worship... Now, do we do it perfectly? No, no one does anything perfectly. But we try to have book, chapter, and verse for what we do. We are not free to invent or create religious practices or doctrines or teachings based on what John might think or what I might think or somebody else Or might what think. happens to be popular in, in society right. at any particular given point in time. And so that's the challenge, I think, not, not just to pick on this Ash Wednesday thing, but that was... The question, there's not a biblical foundation or a biblical reason that supports Ash Wednesday, therefore we don't practice it. Well, and it should come as no surprise that the handful, and I think it's a very small handful of, of congregations within churches of Christ that would do something like this. These are the same congregations yeah. that are disregarding the clear teachings well. about the divisions of men and women and their responsibilities. Yeah. I permit not a woman to teach or take authority Serve over man. Authority. Well, that's culturally conditioned. We don't have to worry about that. Some Archaic, of these old-fashioned. Some of these places have already added instrumental music services. Well, look, they're free to do what they want to do. And, and I, honestly, I don't lose a lot of sleep about whatever these brethren want to do. That's their business. We recognize congregational autonomy. Correct. If they want to go and sacrifice a goat this Sunday uh, up on the stage, have at it. You know, uh, although they, in Arkansas they, they, it would probably they draw the line at snake handling. Although in Arkansas it would probably be a pig, and you'd have pulled oh, pork no, with the barbecue no. that follows. But here's the thing: we're going to do here what the Bible authorizes us to do. That's it. And we're not going to add anything to that. And if somebody else wants to do it, I'm not judging them. But at the same time, well, why don't you do this? Well, how long you got? We can sit down and tell you why we don't do this. But it's the same pattern. It's the same methodology that, that drives everything that we do. As John said, we try to speak where the Bible speak. speaks, and we try to be silent where the Bible is silent. The Bible doesn't say a word about Ash Wednesday. Now, if somebody wants to do this and it makes them feel closer to God, look, it's free country. You can do what you want. But in terms of us making this a church mandate or Ritual, a church doctrine, liturgy, doctrine. Or new, I mean, what John just said from Matthew 15 bears repeating, mm -hmm. and it bears uh, it bears some study.
Because Jesus is saying, when you substitute the clear commands of God for the teachings or traditions, traditions. of men, he says that you worship me in vain. That's it. He says you're basically, it's wasted motion. You're not accomplishing what you're intending to do. That's right. a really important charge. Oh, I think it, he doubles down on that. Uh, previously over in Matthew 7, he said something to the effect that, um, I, I get away from me when they say, well, wait, Lord Lord, says to me, Lord, Lord, we, we the kingdom of done heaven. great works. We've cast out demons. We've done many wonderful things. We got a big crowd. We got people coming and celebrating Lent. Listen, I never knew you. He said, I, I never, knew, never you. knew you. That thing that you're doing that makes you feel good doesn't have anything to do with what I requested and commanded you to do. And so we need to be careful. And uh, what about was that. it, John, that triggered Jesus saying that I never knew you? He's obviously oh. not saying he didn't know who we were, he did. What he is saying is, I am so offended by the practices, by the practices that you are adopting, and I've asked you to do this, 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 this and, and this, this, and you don't want to do it, and yeah. you've made up other things. So he says, if you want to go on your own way, go ahead, yeah. but let's not act as if you know th 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 <laughs> that we have this close contact anymore. Uh, my wife and I have a running joke. Uh, early on in our marriage, we, we were trying to understand his needs, her needs differently, and said, well, Let's, let's talk about it like this. What if you decided you wanted to give me my favorite thing, which is chocolate cake, and you went and you got your recipe booklet out and you worked hard in the kitchen and you really baked the very best strawberry cake. I mean, it was out of sight. And you brought it to me and you're saying, hey, I made you this wonderful strawberry cake. And I'm looking at it and thinking, yeah, it's a fine cake. But what I asked for was chocolate. Well, she decided she knew better than you. Uh, well, maybe she likes strawberry better. Therein lies the discussion. So who and cares so when about God you? She's asks doing what she wants to, to do. Do what He wants, and then we go and substitute what we want and expect God to be, you know, just delighted with that. We're we're really laboring under now, a wait false a minute, illusion. Now wait a minute here, brother Philip. Okay. So so what you're suggesting, if I'm following you? Yep. So the very first time the gospel was presented mm -hmm. in its simplicity and in its clarity. Yes, sir. When people ask the question, what, what must, must we do? do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your nah, sins. Nah, just go. How about just go feel, and pray the good. sinner's prayer? How nah. about accept Jesus into your heart? How about acknowledge that Jesus exists somewhere? And Think about these Because baptism's a work, and we're not going <laughs> to do baptism. You see where this is going? Yeah. Okay, we're either going to do the things that the Bible tells us to do, or, or we're going to make this up as we go along. That's it. And look, you know, if you And wanna, a lot of people are, by the way. If you want to make it up as you go along, the Constitution of the United States guarantees you the right to do that. But, but I would caution you, the Constitution of the United States has nothing to do with the Bible of the Creator God of the universe. Okay, so if the Bible says X and you decide to say why, my friend, proceed with great caution. Okay, the, the Bible has a lot of warnings about those who add to or, or those take who away take from, away. Yeah. And in the case of Ash Wednesday, I mean, if a person wants, I, I, I still remember this as plain as day. We had, we had a cadre of professional substitute teachers back in the, the Michigan public school system, which when I was going was actually sure. pretty solid. Sure. And I remember one, uh, her name was Mrs. Beakey, the most pleasant substitute teacher you've ever seen, a devout Catholic. And if she was there on Ash Wednesday, she had would have little, the ashes in yeah. her forehead. Me being a good little Church oh, of Christ no. boy. Tell me you didn't. No, I didn't say anything, but I was curious. And, uh, and I, I asked her one day, I said, so I don't know much about this. She said, well, this is Ash Wednesday. My church recognizes that. And, and she went through the whole litany of why we do this and why we do that. Listen. I didn't doubt the woman's sincerity right. for a minute. Right. I don't today. I mean, she was a great lady. But at the same time, you're going to be really, you're going to be on thin ice if you're trying to explain this practice to somebody and they want to see, well, what does the Bible teach about this? Because the Bible is completely silent about yeah. that. It is. So it's one of those things where um, make it clear that we're not jumping down anyone's throat not and trying all. to uh, make fun of someone's um, pious and sincere beliefs, they may be honest and sincere, but we would state that biblically they're sincerely wrong. And so the question, what does the Bible say about Ash Wednesday? The answer is nothing.
because there's no biblical statement uh, regarding that as a practice. Hope that this has been helpful. Hope that um, you will uh, search the scriptures to find Bible answers to Bible questions, and we appreciate you tuning in tonight to be a part of our study. Chuck, lead us in a prayer. Absolutely. Father, we're grateful that we can come to the scriptures and we can find answers to life's questions. And Father, we recognize that in the confusion of the religious world around us, uh, that folks are fond of substituting the traditions of men for your commandments. Father, help us always to ask that question, what does the Bible teach about a matter before we proceed? And Father, help us to draw close to you. And Father, we know when we draw near to you, you will indeed draw near to us. Help us to search the scriptures, to study, to show ourselves approved. And Father, we're concerned about the degree of confusion and chaos that goes on in the world around us. Father, help everything that we do uh, to be done to your glory, to your honor. Help us to be good ambassadors. And Father, when we stumble, which we do, we pray that you forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And Father, continue to keep us uh, fixated on you, the author and finisher of the faith, in whose name we offer this prayer, Jesus the Savior, and amen. Hello, I'm Chuck Monan for the Pinnacle Church of Christ, where we are living and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We'd like to invite you to come over to our new digs on One Shackleford Drive, and there's an easy way to remember this location. The Bible tells us there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and there's one Shackleford Drive. Now, that last part's not in the Bible, but that's where we are. We've got a wonderful new facility. We've got new folks streaming in each week. We've got young folks and old folks and rich folks and poor folks and black folks and white folks and every other kind of folk in there. You will be at home at the Pinnacle Church. You will be welcomed. You will be treasured. You will be loved. And you'll find a place where you can put your abilities, your talents and gifts to work in the service of our Savior. So we invite you to come out this Sunday to the Pinnacle Church of Christ. You'll be glad that you did.